Welcome to Burning Down the Blocks, Sparking Collaboration Through Creative Play. Um, I'd like to start off with just a little anecdote of the first brainstorm I was ever a part of. One of my first jobs right out of college, um, I worked in the packaging department of a comic book company. We had the G.I. Joe license. And everyone in my department, we all wanted to be working on the comics, but we weren't. So we were super excited when Hasbro said they wanted the packaging to match the comic books. So we got to go do a brainstorm. Our creative director called us up, and he was a big name in comics, so we were all really excited. He said, we're going to do a brainstorm. We're going to talk about what kind of packaging we could do. Let's talk about the art. My team and I spent a week preparing. Um, we were the digital department, so we had all these mock-ups on our computers. Um, the day of the brainstorm, we packed up our giant white clamshell Mac laptops and hiked across to the publishing department. Um, we got into the room, and there was no digital hookups to project what we had, and they all had their sketch easels and their blue pencils. Um, and he didn't, you know, our creative director didn't want to look at our computers, and he, he just looked around the room and you know, said, does anyone have any ideas? He just kind of put it out there, and he was a big, important person. We were all scared. We cared a lot about what he thought about us, so we all clammed up and just kind of looked around at each other. He waited a moment and said, well, I've got a couple ideas, and just started giving dictation to his you know, senior artists, who immediately started sketching while we kind of sat there and twiddled our thumbs. Um, and after about 15 minutes of that, he handed us the sketches and said, great, let's do this. Great brainstorm, everybody. So there's a lot of great collaboration techniques out there, but if you're not using them between your different departments, you're not really maximizing the creative potential of your different teams. And that's what we're going to talk about today, some activities that you can do with your entire company to get everyone bought in and really maximize groupthink dynamics. So I'm Anna Van Slee. I've worked in the toy and game industry for a little more than 10 years. I've been really fortunate to work on brands like G.I. Joe and Transformers and My Little Pony and kind of help these brands evolve from physical one-way communication like packaging and product design and animated series into really interesting and exciting digital realms where we're having a two-way conversation with our consumers. And one thing that I've learned is as we become more complicated in our products and the ways we communicate with our consumers, people become more specialized and more siloed. So there's a greater need for this creative collaboration and really taking the time to think uh, with these different specialized people very early on in the process. This is Carolyn Chandler. Hi. Whoa, very loud. Um, Carolyn Chandler. I've been in the field of user experience design for over 16 years. Was lucky to get involved really early on, um, before the term user experience was widely being used, mm. um, and have worked in a variety of different companies, uh, at agencies and at companies that had their own products they were developing. So I got to see a lot of the organizational issues and barriers that come into play when people are talking about design and trying to handle collaboration. Um, written a couple of books in the field, also Project Guide to UX Design, and then uh, most recently with Anna, Adventure, Adventures in Experience Design. And what we've really been focused on is how do we teach people some of these techniques and tools for more creative thinking together in a way that's really playful, because that tends to be what helps people break down some of the barriers. Um, when you can play together and be creative together, uh, you can immerse together. And so that's some of the things that we've been really focused on in this and that we plan on covering here. Um, we're going to be looking at something that fits into this structure. Uh, how many people have heard of discover, define, develop, and deploy as a process? Looks about maybe a third. Um, that's, called, that's, that's from the software development life cycle. And I uh, worked with that quite a bit and always felt like it kind of pigeonholed design because so much of discovery takes a really good design eye to see possibilities and needs for users. Um, and also just defining, being able to use design techniques like visualization in order to define what you need. It's such a powerful tool. So we took a look at that structure and said, how about instead of that, we talk about sponge, spark, splatter, sculpt, and storytell. And I'm a big fan of SP words, like spork and spelunking. And you know, they're just, it's part of that visceral feeling that you're creating something. It's artistic. It's intentionally messy at, at points. Um, so we're, basically, sponge is when you really immerse yourself into the problem space. Go out and do field research. Take a look at what people are doing now, where there might be some opportunities to improve it. Maybe talk to some people. Uh, and use some of those things to challenge your own assumptions. We're going to be touching a little bit on that uh, with the activity we're doing today. Spark is where you take some of the problems that you notice 
and really get to the root of some of those problems and start to ask those high, how might we questions that open up your thinking. How could we make this better? How could we remove the bad things about the situation? And you look for something that really has a good spark between a, a really juicy problem and a solution you think could have some impact on it. Then when your team is on the same page about a solution idea, you splatter together, brainstorm, te brainstorm techniques to get a lot of out ideas out there. And then you sculpt, you have to start saying no to things. Um, we call it a savvy no, ideally based on who you are as a company. And then finally, storytell, because a lot of teams will stop at the end when they have something. They don't necessarily take the time to make sure the whole team knows how to tell the story of what you've created. So that when you're talking to investors, when you're talking to customers, when you're talking to other internal folks like your C-level people, the team is united in how they got somewhere and they feel like they can really defend the decisions that you all made together. So today we're gonna really focus a little bit more on the sponge moving into Spark area. And here's how we're gonna do that. We're gonna look at a couple of those barriers to co-creation, really common stuff that I'm sure everyone has experienced before, but it's good to be really mindful of those things going into these sorts of activities. Um, we're gonna talk about some collaboration strategies, which is really the ingredients and the cognitive mindset that you need to bring to these activities. That we're gonna actually do an activity together. Just the beginning portion of it, because we don't have that much time, but Carol and I have a couple different case studies to talk through different ways to use it, and when you go back with your teams, ways you can run this and expand this over multiple days. Um, and then we can end with some tips and tricks and hacks. We've run this in a couple different situations with a couple different kinds of companies, and some of the things we've noticed um, that we can kind of add on to the process at the end. So, let's talk about our problems. <laughs> let's start with departmental silos, very common. Um, this can be something you deal with at your own company or also um, you know, client side if you're engaging with a client. Um, departments and roles are great for a lot of reasons. They're good for organizing workflows, project managers couldn't live without them, we need them to organize our billable hours and to estimate things. And, they do help facilitate social interactions. It's nice when you approach someone to know what their role is. It makes that interaction more comfortable. So a lot of upside, but some of the downsides are you tend to get this assembly line process. And the short, uh, you really get to shortchange the thinking at the start of a project if everyone is sort of pigeonholed in their department and you have these flows. Um, it doesn't bring everyone together and it doesn't facilitate conversation. Another favorite barrier of mine is generation gaps. There are four different generations currently in the workplace. Um, being in the toy and game industry, I work with a lot of baby boomers who love to talk on the phone. I don't love to talk on the phone. I don't think it's a great way to communicate. Um, so it's good to be mindful of people's different generational communication preferences and what mediums they're comfortable in. It's good to know that about yourself, too. Oh, sorry about that. Um, it's good to know that about yourself, too, going into um, you know, different projects and organizations so that you can be more willing to be self-aware and to compromise. Um, the flip side of that coin as well is it, people tend to get stereotyped. I mean, how many people have been on a project where, you know, someone pointed to someone and they're like, well, you're really our consumer, you're our target demographic, so your opinion matters more. You know, I'm a mom too, and so here's my opinion, and that's why it carries more weight on this project. So those sorts of things, people, people tend to get pigeonholed. And the whole point of the design process, right, is that we're empathizing with our consumers and that when you step out of your shoes into a new role, you're bringing something else to that that will help you approach the problem from a different perspective. Um, I also work with a lot of young, frustrated millennials who there's a lot of assumptions made about how they communicate and what media they're proficient in. Um, one girl I work with in particular isn't even on Facebook, and people are always shocked when they find out that someone her age doesn't have a Facebook account. So um, it can go both ways, both stereotypes, and it's just good to be self-aware when you do sort of fit your generational profile. Another big barrier, power distance. Has anybody heard of this before? This is from a, a model by Geert Hofstede. He worked with a lot of um, intercultural issues, especially international differences. And um, so it really started out as more of a cultural difference that way, that there are uh, employees, if you're thinking about a company, that accept and believe that there is a large distance between their power and those uh, in upper management, for example. And so you might go to companies like this where you end up in meetings and a lot of the meeting is spent saying, well, what would Bob say? Or what would Joan want us to do right now? Um, 
And there's a belief sometimes, I think, in these organizations that upper management wants it that way. I think a lot of upper management has realized that that can stifle the creativity and innovation of companies. So power distance, although some, some organizations can work maybe more effectively when there's a clear line of decision making, it's not necessarily uh, something that really lends towards a lot of innovation when you're talking about teams that are trying to develop products or services. So uh, with the chaos that some of these obstacles may have in your organizations, um, one thing that's really good to do is keep calm and start introducing some of these collaborative techniques, um, some of the strategies to maximize the good kind of group think, think dynamics. So one of the things that um, we've found to be really effective here is to use focus challenges. Uh, these are challenges that provide enough structure that people feel like they can work in the same, using the same rules, but it's challenging enough that the whole group has to immerse and come together in order to solve that problem. This is, uh, if it, who has heard of uh, Flow by uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi? A few people, okay. So um, the, the concept of Flow is that people are generally at their happiest when they have a challenge ahead of them that is challenging enough that they have to really grow, but not so challenging that they get anxious or overwhelmed. And play is a really excellent way to bring this out. I mean, video games, anybody who's lost a weekend to a video game knows that they're really designed to ladder you up in your experiences. So any activities that you can do that kind of get everybody on the same page quickly but give them a challenge that they need to reach together can really do a great job at breaking down some of those walls. Another good thing to have in your mental toolbox is the idea of abductive problem-solving logic. There's three types of problem-solving logic. Um, probably the most famous is Sherlock Holmes' favorite. It's deductive logic. Um, but again, that's taking the evidence at hand and finding the solution. It's the idea that the solution is already there. It's inherently there, already there before you. You just have to discover it. There's inductive logic. That's what scientists use. Um, really, that's the scientific method. And again, it's very myopic. It's a very reductive type of problem-solving logic. It's saying, here's what's at hand and I'm going to make a hypothesis about this causality and then try and disprove it. Um, what we use in the creative industry here is abductive logic. It's really the only type of problem-solving logic that brings that outside odd duck element in and see what impact that has on our solution. So it's saying sort of A plus B plus F equals C. Um, and that F is really important. Um, there's a couple reasons why. One, sometimes it can spawn really outside of the box ideas in and of itself. You might think about you know, fire trucks in a new way if you're bringing pillow technology into them or you know, just something totally off the wall. But more importantly, what bringing in those odd elements does is it forces you to reconsider the elements you have at hand from a new perspective. And it really pushes your thinking beyond that first level of the obvious, which is the most difficult obstacles to do in a team when you're brainstorming. And last but not least, play. Um, Play is much easier said than done, setting up a playful atmosphere, but it is really important, um, and there's a couple reasons why. Um, we've talked a lot about power distances, and people naturally, when you're ideating and you know, having ideas, they're personal. They're a part of you, and um, you, know, you, you care about what other people think, but you also have a certain attachment to your own amount of ideas, and play makes it okay to throw out suggestions and ideas, it levels the playing field for everyone. If you think about when you're kids and you're playing, you're constantly switching and trying on new roles. Um, when it's an environment that's working, it facilitates an everyone is equal atmosphere, which is really great to sort of lower some of those fear of rejection. It lets people get silly um, and sometimes throw out some pointless ideas, but that's good because again, it kind of lowers that social boundaries that we have as adults where we're just too aware of what other people think about us and that, that inhibits creativity. So let's do that with each other now. We're gonna um, talk about a couple kinds of Sparkathons. Um, this one that we're gonna start right here is called a problem finding Sparkathon. So this is what you might do. Uh, it's really good if you feel like your team is jumping to solutions too quickly and not stepping back and thinking about that larger picture. Um, what is the situation that we wanna improve? What are the assumptions we're making about that situation? Uh, and ideally, this involves some field exploration. We're not going to actually have you go out in the street and interview people in the next you know, 20 minutes. But um, if you do this as a couple day event, it's really nice to get people started and then have them go out in the field and then come back and see what they really did notice as part of their exploration. So uh, let's start this out now. Um, if anybody, who has never played Mad Libs? Sorry, that's a horrible way to ask it. Who has played Mad Libs? OK, <laughs> all right. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, you might have to switch it or drag it over. Sorry, guys. 
Right. There, we there we go. All right. We're going we're gonna, to um, generate a Mad Lib, a series of Mad Libs here together. Yes. So you're going to shout, just shout out, and we'll, what we hear, um, we'll put in here. So first we need um, a few different activities. Now these are things like running a marathon or eating a messy burger. Uh, feel free to shout. Anything? Beer. What's that? Brewing beer. One more time. Brewing, Brewing beer. Fantastic. Hopscotch. Hopscotch. Hot Playing hopscotch. What's that? Hot tubbing. All right. Uh, let's see, how many do we have? We're seeing cat tree. We need uh, about three more. Yeah. Bicycling? Okay. Bicycling. You can get silly if you want. Watching Star Wars. Watching Star Wars. What made you think of that? <laughs> and maybe one more. Rock climbing. Okay, cool. Uh, now we're going to actually hop over to user types and think of um, this could be uh, just kind of specific like grumpy teachers or um, kind of attention challenged eight-year-olds, things like that. What comes to mind? Harley driving grandmas. Harley driving grandmas. <laughs> Doesn't have, no, to, don't look at these, uh, yeah, think of these totally separate for now. We'll get, we'll get to that. Just na user types that come off the top of your head. Angry teenagers? All right. Disgruntled taxi drivers. <laughs> Disgruntled taxi drivers. I think we had one yesterday. Granola munching hippies. <laughs> good. Those are good. Mommy bloggers. Mommy bloggers. All right. Professional circus performers. Professional circus performers? All right. Cool. I think I'm missing one. Are we missing one? Thank Mommy you, bloggers, yeah. yeah. Hipsters. Hipsters. Okay, maybe we can stop there because we'll have them all on the screen. Um, okay, now finally the improvements. Now, when we're working with companies, a lot of times people will say easier or more accessible, and we want to get sillier than that. We want to use words that are maybe a little bit more evocative if you can. So it could be like more luxurious rather than more, pl you know, more pleasant or something like that rather than like nicer. Less itchy or less, less itchy. Yeah. If you have some yeah. Good negative adjectives. Again, don't look at the other two yet. We're just throwing out words like that. What comes to mind? More slushy. More slushy. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is the hardest one, I think. Softer. Okay. Cool. More fluid. More fluid. Nice. That's a nice. So that's a nice alternative to just saying like more intuitive. In a way, when you think of fluid, you think that you could actually explore that visually too, really nicely. Get some more here. More tactile, nice. That's a good one. Is that okay? Friendlier. Friendlier. Oh, good one. Yeah. Less stupid. Less stupid. Okay. <laughs> Maybe two more. Get silly if you need to. What's that? Huggable. Oh, that's great. What's that? More bitter. Okay, cool. All right, so as you guys were already anticipating, we're going to actually combine these together to make a sentence. So if you think of this as a challenge of something that you might want to explore, the, the whole uh, sentence is we want to make this activity improved in this way for this user type. So what combinations do you see that you think would be pretty fun to explore? Like, for example, watching Star Wars. Making watching Star Wars more tactile for angry teenagers would be <laughs> very fun to, yeah. to challenge, uh, challenge to solve. Maybe you have to build a model of the Millennium Falcon or something like that. Although they might get angry and rip it apart. <laughs> okay, brewing beer more bitter for hipsters. Hot tubbing more huggable. Hmm. <laughs> Hopscotching less stupid for professional circus performers. So that could be interesting because professional circus performers could be kind of bored by, hop, by hopscotching. But maybe there's something that actually is a game you could in, uh, design that makes it more challenging for them. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they have to, uh, if they're the kinds that are very bendy, they have to like cover two, uh, two spots at a time, right? So that's, that's the kind of thing that you want to do is pick something that you think starts to um, have the team ask those questions, like what are really the problems that we're trying to solve? 
with this, you know? And so, and you, you look at it at first, it seems kind of silly, but sometimes you end up with ones that really end up uh, giving you solution ideas that could make an impact. Mm -hmm. So for example, I worked with one class where they said, we want to make um, biking more luxurious for bald men. And then they went out and observed and, and talked to bald men and found, uh, they said, well, our helmets, you know, the more expensive they are, the more holes they have. So I get sunburned, or when I get sweaty, it slips around. You know, so there's a few things in the design there that are broken. So then let's go figure out if we can design a better helmet. So you actually found a problem that needed solving. Right. Yeah. So we're going to pick one now that you're going to, and you're going to um, talk to your neighbors and just talk for two to four minutes about what kind of assumptions you would make about this particular um, challenge and what problems you think exist. Um, and then we'll, we'll end that part of it talking about how you might uh, go out and challenge some of those assumptions. So which one should we pick? So we had brewing a beer more bitter for hipsters. Mm -hmm. How many people like that one? Just a couple. Just a couple, a couple hands. Okay. How about hopscotching uh, less stupid for professional circus performers? Maybe a couple Got more. A couple okay. Yeah. Still not totally. Okay. Let's see, hot tubbing, <laughs> more fluid. Hmm, it's already pretty fluid. Do you want to say watching Star Wars more tactile for angry teenagers? Okay, let's do that one. Let's do that one. So what, what would engage angry teenagers in st the next generation, right? Now there's the new Star Wars coming out. What would actually make this experience more tactile? So maybe you get into Internet of Things or things like that that will actually um, make this a very different experience for the, the angry teenagers of this generation, maybe make them a little bit less angry. Um, so that'll be our, our area, and uh, actually maybe we just, yes, ta-da, all right. Um, we're going to take that, and we're going to spark there up a go. solution. Um, so get together with folks, I'd say two to four, and just write down some of these things. What's good about the situation now? What's good about Star Wars, um, for example? What's good about tactile things that can immerse with you into something? Um, what's broken? What is it that are maybe making those teenagers angry? And how could the solution get past that? You know, uh, Write down a few of the different problems that you come up with. And then uh, we'll give you a few minutes to do that. And then when we call everybody back together, we'll have a few people share some of the problems that you explored. Sound good? All right. I'll leave this up so you have it. Yeah. I'm going to say five minutes. Mm -hmm. We'll give you guys about five minutes. We'll give you a warning. All right, so uh, maybe we get uh, just a couple people to share one of the interesting problems that, that uh, um, or positive things that came out of their discussion. Anyone interested? Yeah, uh-huh. Star Wars is too mainstream. Too mainstream, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so how, if you were going to try to improve the experience, how would you make it edgier in some ways? We were actually talking about the um, more bitter, and then you could actually say, how do we make Star Wars more bitter for angry teenagers so that it feels right? <laughs> you could, you could cool. see some snarky kind of t-shirts or something. Yeah. yeah, Darth Vader with tattoos. Um, cool, okay, anything else? Anybody else want to share something that came up? Uh-huh. <laughs> that sounds fun. Oh, that's great. Like that. That's like a family kind of thing. That's fantastic. Okay, great. Some wonderful ideas. Um, so uh, what you would want to do next then is take some of those you know, problems and assumptions you have and go out in the field. So where might you go to test out some of these thoughts? Maybe your very own home, right? You can talk to your own angry teenager. Where, would you, where might you find high school? Like, find lots of angry teenagers in high schools. Um, maybe they're maybe they're at game stores and things mm -hmm. like that. You might find the, the ones that would be more likely to, to watch Star Wars, not to stereotype, but <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of those activities you might want to actually go and just hear uh, them talking as naturally as possible, and then do an intercept and ask them maybe why they look so angry. People love it when you say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Smile. Um, so uh, so anyway, that would be the next thing you would do if you were going to be doing this um, with your team. And just to do a quick case study here, uh, describe something that um, happened in one of the classes I teach where we'd start with this challenge at the beginning and one of the teams picked, we want to make dance way sassier for the elderly. So first they went through and said, well, what are our assumptions around this? What problems do we think uh, exist? 
and they broke it out into, we feel like there's gonna be physical problems of just the, the range of motion maybe, accessibility, being able to get to venues where they might be able to dance, um, emotional, the assumption was that elderly might be crotchety. Um, so is that true? When would they feel, like, do they want to feel sassy? What makes them feel sassy? Um, and, you know, what kind of motivation would actually um, make this something exciting beyond the normal uh, everyday thing that they might um, attend? So one of their assumptions was there might not be a lot of options. Um, they went out to a couple of places, including a retirement home. And they found that, actually, if you look at the picture on the right, this is from their trip, um, there are a lot of activities out there. A lot of the activities tended to be more at the space in the retirement home itself. And they talked to some of the folks there and said, well, when do you feel sassy? And they said, well, we, we feel sassy when we can dress up and do something, like make it really an event. So it gave them a lot of great ideas. They challenged the assumption. They said there's a lot of active seniors out there. They want more variety in some of the things that they're doing. Um, they used some of that to <laughs> create personas. <laughs> Crotchety Carl, you know, it's a little bit, you know, it definitely makes fun of him, but it's kind of that thing of, okay, well, how do we help Crotchety Carl, like, really engage with this? What would speak to him? Um, so we had that persona um, that came out of it for them when they were designing and thinking of those how might we statements. So how might we amp up the good? That we have people who uh, would be interested in doing something new. How can we remove the bad, the fact that transportation can be a limitation to be able to, able to get out to other venues? Um, using unexpected resources, they found that there were a lot of resources in the community that would be happy to host uh, something for uh, the elderly to come, uh, health-related uh, places, YMCAs, uh, places like that that had venues. Um, and how could they challenge that assumption that, that uh, the people they're designing for were kind of stuck in their ways um, and get over some of those physical limitations? So um, what they did then was move into the green area of um, the spark frame that we've been going through. This is something that's in, in the book, and I believe we have, the hand, or we have handouts showing some of this. Mm -hmm. Um, and we encourage people to come up with multiple solution ideas, which is why we have three boxes in it, um, because it's really easy to just jump to one and say, hey, we're, we're good. Um, you really want to push it, because sometimes the third one's the best. But a couple of the ones that came out for this um, student group was, first, a faux 50s formal, where getting back to they felt sassy when they could dress up, that you could actually dress up like they, in the style of their prom, and then have a themed dance playing the music from the prom, and they would be something that they could have at, their, at the retirement home. Um, or the boogie bus, which was basically take them to different venues and be playing music on the bus that they could, so they could basically take the party with them uh, and not worry so much about transportation. So um, this was a really fun process for them and it was really good for them to get out and challenge assumptions and come up with something that had some user insights as part of the decision. So in summary, the oops, sorry, activity we just did and the case study that Carolyn just talked through is really a problem finding way to use the Sparkathon. Um, I did want to caveat too, we did it all in the keynote slide and I think we had a very perceptive audience member who started to connect the dots. That's definitely not something you want your team to do when you're doing this exercise. You want them to think independently about the activities, the improvements, and the users. Um, the way we've done this with companies and teams, we'll do it separately on whiteboards or different easels. Um, and then the Mad Libs magic is when they all come together. You really want kind of an aha moment when people realize um, these disparate things are going to come together and you can start to draw these delightful dots and these weird associations. Um, but this is great for your team as a warm-up exercise. You can do it like we did it, just kind of open-ended, whatever is coming to mind for people. But you can also do it if you're digging into a new industry, if you're trying to think of an idea to pitch to a client, if you're doing a product ideation. You can kind of theme it. So thinking of users and activities and improvements um, just within a specific vertical. Um, this is a great way to just kind of an open-ended brainstorming session with everyone on your team. A, a, different way, oops, a different way that you can use this is the problem-solving Sparkathon. Um, and I won't do a whole case study just in the interest of time, but um, I'm going to talk through how I've used this technique with um, Nerf or Bell. Is anyone familiar with that brand, Nerf or Bell? No? Oh, that makes me a little sad, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Nerf for girls. Um, so we had, um, when you're doing a problem-solving Sparkathon, you bring to the table, you've kind of already figured out your user personas and your research. In this case, we knew we were targeting 8 to 12-year-old girls. Um, so we brought those personas to the table so we could do some very specific role-playing. Um, but most importantly with the problem-solving is that you have a lot of constraints. Um, we knew we were going to have to design a plastic toy that shot foam darts. 
So that was a pretty heavy constraint. Um, we knew we wanted to add a virtual experience to that. We knew girls didn't have as good of aim as boys, and we wanted them to be able to play with boys um, and compete with them. So we had some very real problems that needed solving, and then we were able to bring in some sort of off-the-wall elements that helped us think outside the box, um, which led to the invention of the Heartbreaker bow, which is the sort of premier product in the line. It's really fun, but it's a, it's a bow and arrow, essentially. We were, um, we had brought in some sort of entertainment outside elements that let us kind of connect the dots between Hunger Games and Brave and some of these popular characters that were in popular culture. And we just decided girls wanted a different weapon from boys. And that's what would make this brand special and unique to them. And um, we ended up coming with an augmented reality system that helped them to target. So you can do something around a very specific problem if you have you know, user types or physical constraints or digital constraints. And, um, this is a great way to kind of dig into those problems. And then you really want to go into like a more robust brainstorming um, session. So you want to come up with different solution ideas, but from there, different ways to explore those solution ideas. So if you're looking at a physical product and a digital product or maybe a smart product, and really make sure you dig in a layer deeper beyond the obvious to look at um, you know, the possible different expressions thereof. And of course, prioritization is right, key. Yeah, so we had a workshop yesterday about, about uh, prioritization and the importance of being able to visualize things together as a way to see this come, the features that you might have uh, come together in the flow that a user might experience. Uh, so it's one way to actually get people to understand the decisions that they need to make and when they have to say no, when you start to really flow it out and say, ah, this doesn't, there's way too much stuff here on this particular screen, or these features just don't seem to be meshing well together. Um, doing that uh, individually and then putting it up uh, on the walls and just letting it stand for itself so people can vote on their favorite features or ideas that they think really can make an impact. And then sharing that and doing another round together where you're incorporating some of those ideas and building on the best. Um, those are the kinds of things that really uh, start that we are creating together feeling um, that also makes people across each of those levels understand um, the importance of it and, and feel like they've had something uh, to contribute to the solution that you're coming out with. And last but not least, in the sort of the entire process we go through in the book, but in the problem solving Sparkathon, um, you want to have the, what we call the storytell chapter. And typically, I think there's a major disconnect here at a lot of companies um, between sort of marketing and branding and product design and development. And it's really important that those two are in sync. Um, I've heard people from different departments talk about the same product, and you would not think they were talking about the same product with the language they were using. So it's really important to bring your teams together to storytell to each other what you think your product is, what is the narrative of your product, um, so that when you are internally aligned, when you start to move towards that external communication, and really, again, products today are a two-way street with your consumers, so they're holding it in their heads, too. It's really important that as you're radiating inside out that everyone is aligned on the same story. So we just talked through the problem-solving Sparkathon. Again, this is a little less playful than the problem-finding. We call it a little more 50-50, because you are definitely focusing in some of those elements on the problem. But it's really good to do this with your entire team to bring everyone together. Um, some tips, tricks, and hacks that we've learned along the way that we wanted to share. These can be used together um, or separately. It's kind of nice in two different phases. Again, using the problem finding as um, almost like a little internal discovery or a warm-up exercise just to kind of get everyone comfortable working together and then kind of focusing in more on the problem with the problem solving. Um, but it's also good just to do warm-up exercises in general. Um, it is difficult to set that play mode. You can't just say, OK, we're all going to play together, and everyone flips a switch. You really need someone that's willing to kind of be either the cruise director and put themselves out there to sort of facilitate that, or just have a couple games that are just making, letting people make connections with each other before you delve into that process. It's really important to take the time to do that. Um, and last but not least, it's good to keep in mind that there are introverts and extroverts out there. So it's important to facilitate different types of communication. Um, it's good to put, I mean, it's nice to have surprise and delight with a Sparkathon, like with the team, but it's good to give people some ideas to get the juices flowing to help them prepare. This will bring down some of that nervousness level. And some people are just better communicators over you know, the written word via email than they are in person. So it's good to take that time and let people have a little, um, little immersion before activities. 
and also to take time after activities. Um, oftentimes, if you have a really great creative session, everyone goes home, they're eating their dinner, walking their dog, taking a shower, and then they have a light bulb moment as they're sort of reviewing their day and thinking about the dialogue they've had with their colleagues. So it's really great to collect that data, too. So make sure you follow up with people and ask them, as they have been thinking about this, what's come to mind, because there's valuable insights to mine kind of after the fact as well. So uh, as we mentioned, we got involved in a little bit of sponge, a little bit of a spark here. Um, hopefully, you can take this or something like this back and use it. I, I always like to challenge people to try to do something like this within the month. Um, after you come to a conference like this, you can be very inspired. But, but what really makes the difference is if you can start to introduce some of the things here. Um, and it, there is such a power to having everybody work together. Um, it is really p pretty amazing what play can do. Uh, so uh, we're actually going to be, um, no, we're not going to take questions now because we're really close up to the end, but um, Anna and I are going to be in a panel with Robert, who is in the back, um, at, for the next session downstairs. And we do have a couple of uh, books here to give away. Um, if you do come to the panel or if you see us uh, wandering around and want to ask us questions, we're happy to answer some of that. Um, we're going to ask a couple trivia questions uh, to make this, um, to give these away. So. Uh, just, we'll have you raise your hand if you, if you have the answer. Who can name the three different types of logic we mentioned? I think, right here? Woohoo! Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you'll get one of these. All right, nice job. Um, and then, uh, who is the author of the book Flow? Uh-huh. Oh, wait, was there somebody? It's way in the back. Oh, sorry, way in the back. Okay, that's close enough, yes. <laughs> it's a very hard name. Great, so you guys won books, come on, uh, we'll, we'll just give them to you right down here. Thank you so much for coming to our session today. Thank you.